The British have been told year in, year out by the BBC, by Sky, by other media outlets that Israel is on the wrong side of legality, fairness, justice. And the British therefore think, of course I'm going to be compassionate and horrified on behalf of the people who are on the wrong end of the Israelis, who stand for injustice, illegality. The Israelis have never bothered to tell people that everything Israel does is moral. The Israelis, it seems to me, have never had a proper strategy for addressing the ignorance of Britain and the West. Shalom and welcome to State of a Nation. I'm Elon Levy. Telling Israel's story in this war has been a challenge because it's not just about the facts. It's about a whole frame of reference. It's not just about details. It's about the whole lens through which audiences around the world view those details. And unfortunately for us here in Israel, so many people watching the news aren't even open to hearing facts that support Israel's case because they already believe a story that's stacked against it. That's the case that my guest on this episode makes. Melanie Phillips is a British journalist, broadcaster, and author. She's a weekly columnist for the Times of London, author of the books London is Stan and The World Turned Upside Down, and writes on her own personal blog at melaniephillips.substack.com. She claims that Israel is failing to win public opinion because it doesn't have a proper strategy to address some pretty massive knowledge gaps around the world. She says it's never even tried to make the case for basic facts, and that leaves decent people thinking that they're doing good by taking the Palestinian side in this conflict, a side that she criticizes with a sharp eye and an even sharper tongue. Melanie Phillips joins me now. Breaking news out of Israel this morning. Shocking hostage taking. Hundreds of Israelis are dead. I want to bring in Israeli government spokesman. Elon. What happens when the four-day pause? How do you resolve this? Where does this go? Up you can't you can't you Melanie Phillips, welcome to the State of a Nation podcast. Hello, Elon. Thank you very much for having me on. I'm happy to have you here because I get to turn the tables now. Do you know why? Tell me. Well, I've given so many interviews to British journalists and now I get to interview a British journalist. Okay, it seems pretty neat. Seems pretty neat, but I don't think you're representative of the other British journalists who've been a little bit more hostile towards the Israeli position, and I think you're going to be hostile from the other direction now. Because my impression from some of the British journalists I've been interviewed by, not all of them, and I don't want to generalise, sometimes the tone is very condescending, very patronising, very didactic. From the British journalists, the attitude that I feel sometimes is like they're telling me, you're a very naughty boy, and you know you're a very naughty boy, so now sit on the naughty step and tell me why you've been a very naughty boy. Do you find share that impression of the British media environment? Uh, they take a pretty hostile and aggressive view uh, attitude towards me, not just over Israel, but over a whole bunch of issues. Uh, because I am uh, known to be the person who allegedly moved from left to right. I've worked for The Guardian for 20 years, um, and my views did move, but I was, as I would see it, I moved from leftism to sanity. <laughs> leftism to sanity. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about your intellectual journey. Um, but I'm wondering specifically since October 7th, you famously very strident views, but also you've been on this intellectual journey. And so I'm wondering since October 7th, has anything changed in the way that you see the world in the wake of that earthquake? Has it forced you to revisit some opinions you had before? Well, this may sound a bit like, you know, my greatest hits revisited, but it's like I've been living through a speeded up version of what I've been trying to say for the last 30 years. And so you see this as a moment where since October 7th, perhaps your opinions haven't changed. You've doubled down and seen affirmation of what you were saying yes. all along, but you do detect a shift in Western discourse yes. towards re-evaluating the, the Islamist threat? Yes. Well, not just the Islamist threat, but also uh, what's going on here. Um, I wouldn't like to exaggerate the degree to which that has taken hold in the population. But there is a significant uh, number of people in the, as I, as I would call it, the, the apolitical part of Britain, who are saying, well, this is appalling. Uh, why are these people uh, screaming in this way? Why are they breaking the law? Why are they all screaming for Hamas when Hamas are actually menacing uh, the Israelis? 
there's a significant proportion of ordinary Brits who get that. And what shift do you see then within public discourse there? Well, having... Hang on. And I was also going to say among the left, there are people who have been struck dumb, literally struck dumb by what they've seen because, and some of them have the honesty to say, everything that I supported, the people I supported, the cause I supported here in Israel, the Palestinians and so on, has been turned upside down because I understand the people I supported have been per perpetrating this appalling stuff. Now, there are not many of them who have the honesty to say that. Most of those people are trying to turn the narrative upside down again. But events here have actually caused a shift in terms of perhaps producing more confusion uh, than there had been previously. So how do you see then public attitudes shifting in the West, particularly in Britain, in the wake of the October 7 massacre? Is it just a moment of confusion or do you see polarization or how do you see that? Because we're always trying to be more convincing towards foreign audiences and help to tell Israel's story. And I'm wondering, are the goalposts moving? How has the conversation there been changing in a way that, that as a spokesman I need to adapt to? Well, what is so terrifying and sad and tragic is that despite your efforts... Um, valiant uh, efforts. Despite your heroic No, no, don't exaggerate. Efforts, <laughs> um, I, I've lost count of the number of people who write to me after I've written one of my blog posts. Um, and they've said... Um, I can't believe it. What you've written, I've never heard before. For example, I didn't know that there were so many rockets. I didn't know there were any rockets. Really? Because then they weren't, they're not aware the that Hamas had fired 12,000 rockets at the, the Israeli home front doesn't tell in this me. war. The, the media that I'm reading doesn't tell me. Um, I didn't realise that the ordinary Palestinians have been educated or brainwashed over all these years by the Palestinian Authority. No one has told us that, ever, ever. No one has ever told us that the Jews were the in, are the indigenous people of the land. I thought that after the Holocaust, the Jews had been kind of parachuted in from Europe. No one's ever told us this. Now, why haven't they been, why haven't they been told? Okay, so... And it's interesting you say that because one of the challenges that I confront as a spokesman is that sometimes there is such a massive gulf between what is being reported in the Western media and the story that we tell, that I go on air and I sound like a madman because I am saying things that are being not only not amplified, but act actively denied by a whole alphabet soup of UN agencies and human rights organizations. That, yes. that simply to shift the story towards what is really happening here on the ground, I yes. sound like I'm coming from way well, outside of the Overton window. It's extremely difficult in a situation of crisis like this, where you are necessarily being put in, on, put in a position of being on the defensive. You have an aggressive BBC Sky interviewer saying, you know, why are you killing all these girls and children? And you have to say, we're not killing them because this is why we're fighting a just war. The problem goes much further back. But well, we don't deny that civilians tragically are being killed in this war, but but we say there is an address for that. And that address is the terrorist organization that launched this war, that decided to fight this war Indeed. from inside and under civilian Indeed. areas. And we're doing everything we can to minimize harm Indeed. to civilians without much help, unfortunately, Indeed. from the UN agencies that are supposed to be protecting them. They've been very resistant to our efforts to keep civilians protected. Indeed, you do say that, but you're coming in, what I'm saying is you're, you're, you're coming into a situation in which the ground, unfortunately, has already been prepared for you. Um, and it's ground that you don't stand on because without falling into a terrible deep hole. Because the British people have been led to believe over many years that um, the people who drive the agenda in the Middle East are the Israelis. That the story only Who's kicks off. Who's been telling them that? Uh, the media. I mean, it would be lovely if we were driving the agenda and, and we're, we're working sleepless days to try to make that happen. But, but we, don't, we don't control the media landscape and we don't control the agenda. This is true. Uh, but the Israelis, it seems to me, have never had a proper strategy for addressing the ignorance of Britain and the West. If it had a proper strategy, it would be being proactive, have been, have been proactive over many years, and it would be seeking to educate the British public. One of the things I hear is, look, there is suffering, there is a war, People say, we don't care who started it. We don't care yes. he said, she said, punch and Judy. Like, yes. how do we make this stop? And I'm wondering whether you think that 
going back and saying, well, actually, King David and Joshua and in ancient times and no, then no, technically succession of empires. No, but I wonder whether whether it could ever possibly make a difference, whether people care about these long yes. historical arguments. Yes, they do. I, yes, I, I know that Israelis find this very hard to believe. Because, some, because it's so obvious to us, but we're just exactly. not sure that other people are that moved is, by our same historical narrative. You've put your finger on it. It is so obvious to us. That is the Israeli problem. Because it's so obvious that we are in the right, because it's so obvious that we have a just and moral cause. We don't have to make that argument, and we, it, not just we don't have to make that argument. We, the Israelis, cannot conceive that anybody can think that it's us committing genocide. So you're starting from an entirely false premise. Now you say, what difference would it make? In a situation of war, it's very difficult to, to start from scratch, as it were. Right, this isn't but, the battle we're going to win in the middle of a war. Right, but the Israelis have never accepted for a moment that as far as Britain is concerned, I can only speak about Britain, I don't know about the rest of the West, but as far as Britain is concerned, when you, when you look at sort of ordinary people who are not, have, not driven by a sort of left-wing agenda, but just ordinary people who know very little, all they know is what the BBC and Sky tell them and so on, they have a very fixed view uh, in Britain. Uh, the... the British character, the British culture is suffused with the fundamental imperative of fairness, right? Justice, law. These things are very Such important. Such core elements of the British character. Right. Fair and the play. British have been told year in, year out by the BBC, by Sky, by other newspaper, out, by other media outlets, that Israel is on the wrong side of legality, fairness, justice. And the British therefore think, obviously, well, you know, I'm a decent, moral British person. I'm driven by conscience and compassion. Of course, I'm going to be compassionate and horrified on behalf of the people who are on the wrong end of the Israelis, who stand for injustice, illegality. The Israelis have never bothered to tell people that everything Israel does is moral and just. And this is why. And this goes back a long time. And I've had this conversation with Israelis over the, over, the, over the years. Why don't you tell people? And the answer, first of all, they say, well, why should we take any notice of you? I mean, you're British. OK, fine. That's very helpful. But the real answer is, why should we even try? So I'll say as an Israeli now, we're definitely going to try. But I, I well, want to talk just a little bit about the communications in this war specifically, but I'm intrigued by this question of the long-term strategy. What is the core message that Israel needs to be telling about itself to Western audiences, not during times of crisis and adversity? The most important thing that Israel has, well, one of the most important things that Israel has not told anybody uh, properly is uh, what the people that they are supporting, the people the British are supporting, who are the Palestinian Arabs, what they actually are told and what they think about Jews, not about Israel, about Jews. Um, if people had any idea of what is the, what the Palestinian Authority, forget Hamas for a moment, everyone like boo hiss Hamas. Palestinian Authority is fine. Do you not okay? think they're beginning to pick up on it now with all the revelations about UNRWA and no. the testimonies of the US House about no. what is in the UNRWA, which is the PA curriculum? No, because they don't know about the PA they don't, curriculum. They don't understand where all their tax dollars and euros and pounds have gone into this horrific education system of incitement. Insofar as they understand any of this, they understand that, uh, you know, if they're that way inclined, they would think, oh, how terrible. Our, our taxpayers' money has gone into UNRWA, and who knew that UNRWA was in bed with Hamas? What that, that's, that's, first of all, a lot of people don't accept that, but let's assume that people do accept right. that. That's good. That's an advance. What I'm saying is something different. I'm saying that those people who think that's terrible because they're supporting Hamas, and Hamas is terrible, but the Israelis have got to have a Palestinian state because the Palestinian Authority uh, is fine, and the Palestinians are basically people who just want to have, you know, a state. Now, what is not understood, what the Israelis have never said, is what they are, what the Palestinians as a whole are being taught year in, year out, day in, day out by the Palestinian Authority. They've never been taught about Muslim and Palestinian Arab anti-Semitism. They don't talk about it. Now, it's my view, and I may be wrong, 
But I think the British, who are fundamentally decent, Oops. they know nothing. Now, why do they know nothing? Fault, absolutely, British media. But fault, absolutely, of the Israelis. They've never bothered to tell people. They don't think it's worth their while. And I think during this war, we are trying, at least in the public relations work that I've been doing as a spokesman, to go on the offensive, to take the battle to the UN agencies that have been covering up for sure. Hamas, covering up the fact sure. that it's waging war out of hospitals and built its headquarters underneath the owner of facilities and the tunnels in the schools. Uh, one of the reasons that I wanted you on the show is that as a spokesman, I always have to be very careful and measured about what I say, even if I'm going on the yeah. offensive. And you've always been much more blunt and saying it as you see it and you call the shot. People have very little idea of the lies that they're being fed. And the course, the, 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 the neuralgic issue is, you know, Israel is, is disproportionately killing Palestinian women and children. Um, and I know that you've made this point, but people really don't understand um, the numbers game that's being played and the way it's been played and the way it's way these numbers what are being What do you mean gamed. the numbers game? Well, they know that these are, you know, Hamas statistics. Yes. Okay. So if the media are doing their job uh, that, that they think they're doing their job. The same Hamas that claims that it's destroyed a thousand Israeli tanks, which is, of course, not yeah, but, credible. But, but I'm not aware that the public actually are, are aware of quite why these statistics are so rubbish. Go on. Uh, for example, um, uh, Hamas do not, in their statistics, uh, they do not accept any terrorist, uh, uh, any terrorist. Right, they make no killed. distinction between civilians and combatants. Right. Uh, so Hamas consider all their people civilians and they consider all the Israelis combatants. Right. So they call the hostages uh, prisoners of war. Right. But they, in terms of. Including the, of, those poor children and. Uh, yes, women they're all prisoners of war. October uh, this point has not been made um, adequately. But the, the, the numbers, again, you know, here is the number of uh, uh, rockets, uh, estimated number of Hamas rockets that have fallen short. Here is the number, you know, then there are the Right, people which I also find astonishing. And I, I mention on occasions that we know, I think as of the last update a few weeks ago, over 2,000 Hamas rockets had fallen right. short and exploded in the Gaza Strip. But whatever casualty numbers Hamas has presented, the foreign media will take it for gospel that whatever that number is, right. Israel is responsible for all of right. them, as if Hamas hasn't, okay. you know, Hamas rockets haven't been falling inside Gaza. Okay, so personally, I think that um, Israel should be, again, part of its sort of strategic approach to uh, the disinformation campaign is to say, is to call people out. Um, not just say, but, but Hamas st st statistics are wrong uh, or false, and this is why, but I think it's very important to break it down all the time so people actually have, have an understanding of why they're being lied to. Do you but think to as, say, a, as a journalist that say, works to tell an interviewer to try to call them out and engage them in a sort of argument in an interview? Yes, I do. It does. I do. I think, I think people should, you know, you, if, if, if somebody is saying, um, you know, why are you killing so many women and children? Then you have to say, you know, on what basis do you say that? Because it's not true. Um, because it's, you know, the proportion of, again, a, a key fact which people generally don't know, and I'm sure you've made it, but people need to be re re reminded, um, the, the est even according to the numbers that we're being told, which are probably inaccurate, the best estimate is something like uh, one terrorist to three civilians killed. No, that's far higher estimate. If we take okay. the right. Israeli number of 12,000 Hamas terrorists killed, then even by Fine. their okay. number, we're talking about a much smaller ratio. Fine. But then the key point is, in every war recently... One to one, one to 1. 1.5. In every war recently that Britain and America have been involved in, Iraq, Afghanistan, it's one to five. Much and, higher. And, or, or higher. And, and I made this point in a BBC and, interview as well. He said, it, you know, it doesn't look like the Israelis are... Uh, either being effective or taking seriously the obligation to reduce civilian casualties. And I said, right. well, we're doing a darn better job than your government did right. in the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq right. and ISIS but when some, the but civilian some, to combatant ratio was much fine. higher. I'm glad to hear that's being said. Which it, don't think it, I don't think it can be said enough times. But at the same time, I think that the Israelis collectively should be calling out media organizations by name, saying, you know, this is incitement 
to misrepresent what's happening in Gaza. Do you think media institutions, media outlets respond to that criticism and demands for clarifications and retractions? Is that effective yes, in I holding do. them to account? Absolutely, I it do. It is. Why? I do. Well, because they do not want to have their public or their audience thinking that, they're, that the, the public or the audience are being played for suckers, being told lies and so on. Um, it's one thing seeing a spokesman like yourself embattled with a, an aggressive interviewer, um, holding the line, uh, these are the facts, very important that you say that. But um, they're looking at, you know, there is the Sky interviewer, there is Elon Levy, and like, well, I don't know who's telling the truth. It's, it's, that's the sort of reaction. Now... Well, it's worse than that. It's when the Sky interviewer is saying, Hamas told me this, and the UN says the same thing, and a whole alphabet soup of human rights organizations say the same thing, and it's my word as a government spokesman against half of the world, I think viewers know which side they're taking. That makes my job all the more difficult. And I'm wondering what it is that we don't understand about the starting point with which British or American audiences think about the conflict, about why these organizations that purport to be humanitarian are essentially running interference for Hamas. What do we not understand about how people outside Israel are viewing this conflict? If Britain, I mean, there is absolutely zero appreciation that they're running interference for Hamas. In Britain- They don't understand the way that no, all these UN Britain, agencies are running in Britain, interference for Hamas. If you're a decent, you know, Christian, God-fearing individual who's pretty apolitical, but has a conscience and, you know, you pass the Oxfam shop, you get the, the, the Amnesty International uh, uh, begging bowl in the street. You give because it's for good cause, because it's for Palestinians and it's, it's, for, it's, it's for, humanitarian, for humanitarian purposes. There is zero understanding of the way in which the whole humanitarian industry of NGOs, charities, um, the, 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 the major charities, plus you know the whole apparatus of human rights law and all the rest of it, has been co-opted completely. How? How did that happen? Why have these organizations been co-opted in a way that in this war they are essentially interfering to try to save Hamas's skin after the October 7 massacre and make sure that this war ends with Hamas still on its feet? Because that's to be the logical conclusion of anyone who is trying to demand that this war end with anything other than a total Israeli victory. Well, I think there are a lot of uh, uh, components for that and I wouldn't claim to know all of them at all. First of all, a number of them are under the umbrella of the UN. Um, it is a major international world misapprehension that an, uh, a transnational body like the UN, uh, which is supposed to be in, you know, promoting peace and justice, does that because it's a transnational body. Uh, I see the UN spoken of with so much moral reverence. It's the United yeah, Nations has because said. Because there's a whole orthodoxy in the West that transnational bodies basically promote the brotherhood of man. By their nature. Because they're transnational yes. bodies, whereas nations are only interested in their own self-interest and aggression. Um, people don't understand that if you have a transnational body, which represents most of the countries of the world, given that most of the countries of the world do not observe human rights. Oh yes, they're not exactly liberal democracies, most of the countries in the right. world, Right, so they? if you have a bunch of kleptocracies, dictatorships, tyrannies and rogue states all getting together, i.e. the UN, it is not surprising that they preside over not peace and justice, but the opposite. So all those, that infrastructure of humanitarian aid, of humanitarian groups, uh, not all, but a significant proportion, is going to be devoted to advancing the interests of people who are hostile to democracy, hostile to human rights, hostile to the Jewish people, hostile to the state of Israel. Nobody in Britain understands that because they're fed all the time by the consensus which says you can't trust governments, any government, you can't trust politicians, any politicians, you can't trust, you certainly can't trust the Spokes government. people. You can't trust the government of Israel because everybody knows that if it wasn't for Netanyahu and his right-wing consensus, his right-wing coalition, there'll be peace tomorrow, right? So you can't trust any of these, you know, authorities. What can you trust? You trust people who are 
not government. You trust people who are motivated by compassion. They are backed by the churches. They are backed by the sainted United Nations. They're backed by sainted people. They are sainted people. Fascinating. And that causes us so much grief because we find that Hamas has been using UNRWA, which is effectively, it is a Hamas front. It is the international branch of the Palestinian nationalist movement, using it not only to store tunnel shafts and weapons in their facilities, but also to launder its information for global consumption. Because Hamas claims something, UNRWA then will put it out in a press release with a blue UN logo. And the next thing we know, the International Court of Justice is quoting uh, an UNRWA allegation. And then it's not Hamas saying, it's not UNRWA saying it, it's the International Court of Justice. And it's causing us very serious problems. I think it's extremely difficult for the vast majority of people to get their head around this. I mean, it's a terrible thing that we're all facing here, where you have uh, an international establishment ostensibly devoted to peace and justice and humanitarian and compassionate concerns, which is entirely- Which are very noble values. And it, it would be wonderful if the UN did live the, up to that this, very lofty this mission. This is a terrible thing. You have the most noble values which have been turned inside out. And, you know, with the best will in the world, I mean, it's a very difficult thing to convince people of that. But you certainly can't begin to expect people to begin to understand that unless you start telling them. I want to uh, show you a few cartoons that have come out in Western media over the last few months since the war began and see what you think about them. This is part of how people in the West are receiving messages, cartoons, caricatures, yep. a very effective way to try to put a finger on a particular point that people will instinctively identify with. Let's have a look at some of the images and I'll use this as an opportunity to plug our podcast on YouTube where people can see it instead of me just describing it. Uh, this is a cartoon that went up in the Washington Post, it's a caricature of uh, Hamas spokesman Ghazi Hamad, the one who famously said that uh, they'll do October 7th again and again, October 7th, October 10th, October 1 million, it's all justified. And we see him here strapping four children, four babies to his chest, a woman in a hijab as well. Uh, a photo, a portrait of Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, Hamas founder in the background, and he says, how dare Israel attack civilians while well, he's strapping these civilians to him as human shields. This caricature, actually, the Washington Post then took down and apologized because they were accused of the racist dehumanization yeah. of Palestinians. What do you think about this cartoon? Well, it's an accurate depiction of reality. What, um, what is accurate about it? What's accurate is that uh, this guy is taking these people uh, is using them as human shields and as not just human shields, but as basically cannon fodder. By the way, not much of an exaggeration seeing the footage of Hamas terrorists walking around with children hand in hand to try to yeah. render themselves immune from Israeli attack and the yeah. way that they have in a really disgusting and evil way built all those tunnel shafts inside homes and schools and hospitals and kindergartens yeah, but and But the mosques. reaction is what's so concerning. So why do you think that a caricature like this, which is, I think, so eminently reasonable, would provoke that pushback from people like Owen Jones saying that this is racist dehumanization? What do they see wrong with it? Because you, are, you cannot criticize Muslims uh, uh, in this way. You cannot say that they are murderous, uh, whatever, uh, because obviously that... it's not making a generalization. It's speaking very specifically about Hamas having this murderous agenda. So why would people but rush to defend Hamas? Because Hamas are Palestinians. They are Palestinian Muslims. They are therefore the victims of the Israelis who are committing genocide themselves and who are committing human rights abuses and who are murdering or killing innocent is innocent Palestinian And therefore, civilians. if they are victims by and definition, so they cannot this, be criticized? That's right. No, it not just can't be criticized. This is uh, a, an abuse of, uh, of uh, morality. We are living in a situation in which morality has been turned inside out, language has been turned inside out, right and wrong have been turned inside out. It is the, the nearest parallel we have is the Soviet Union. 
which takes over people's minds so that they no longer just it's not that they no longer can tell the difference between right and wrong they invert it no clearly people are, are getting that, their the right reaction. and wrong inverse I'm, but i'm still struggling to understand why people would object to this caricature because it's inverted because everybody knows under this uh, rubric under this uh, this this terrible brainwashing that's happened Everybody knows that Israelis are the cruel people, Israelis are the aggressors, Israelis oppress the Palestinians, the Palestinians are victims. Hamas are, you know, we might think, say, say this, 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 this point of view, we might think that Hamas go too far, that we can't support the violence, we can't support murder. But and... anything that would seem to undermine their victim narr narrative exactly. is therefore anathema. Nothing, absolutely. The key thing about all this, the key thing about the Western media Uh, uh, narrative, uh, the, the Western me media inversion of right and wrong, victim and victimizer, uh, genocide and victim and so on. The key thing is that nothing, absolutely nothing, can be allowed to upset the narrative. The narrative is that the Israelis are oppressors, aggressors, victimizers, and that the Jews are all powerful. Are you confident that putting more facts out in the public sphere can help people change narratives to which they are emotionally already yes. very invested? Yes, for this reason. First of all, there are a number of decent people who literally know nothing about this and they would be horrified. Secondly, even... And it's important to remember those are the people that we are appealing to. As spokespeople, right. the mum and dad who are washing up dishes and right. watching their kids and even, not necessarily people invested yeah, in this but narrative. Even the people who are uh, signed up to left-wing uh, narratives of the world in which Israel is obviously a colonizing, oppressive, repressive state. Yada, 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 yada. If this kind of material that I'm talking about, Palestinian Media Watch, memory, was put into the public domain, And with the Israelis saying, this is what you're supporting. This is what you are promoting. You're not promoting compassion. You are promoting Nazism. You are promoting demonic anti-Semitism. You are promoting genocidal agendas. It leaves those people with nowhere to go. And it puts them on the back foot. It puts them absolutely on the back That's foot. That's interesting. And for viewers and listeners, everything that memory, uh, that's M-E-M-R-I and Palestinian Media yep. Watch, all available online, easily accessible for yes, anyone who because, wants to access and, and put out these because materials Because the aim themselves. should be to stop people like you from having to be on the back foot all the time and put Israel onto the front foot. And Israel has never understood that. If he does understand it, it can't be. It, it has never been, never, never, dis, never realized how important it is to do that. But the, it's got the material to hand. And I could definitely do with all the help I can get to switch from back foot to going on the offensive. We know that it's after the October 7 massacre. Other people, UN agencies, human rights organizations, so called that owe the world answers so much more that we do as we prosecute what we see as an entirely just war to destroy Hamas and bring back the hostages. Melanie Phillips, thank you very much for joining me on State of a Nation. Good luck, Elon. It's been very um, informative. Good luck. To you. Yes, luck. I will need it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us to the end of today's episode of the State of a Nation podcast. As always, please subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And we'll be back soon with more fascinating, engaging discussions about the state of our nation. Thanks for tuning in.